Welcome back, everyone. We're ready for session number two. This is when we take Doc from the Blue Ridge Mountains all over the world. And we talk about his recording career and his uh, involvement in the folk revival. It's going to be a very, very interesting session. How many of you all were with us for uh, the morning? <laughs> How many <laughs> were not? I'm curious. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, I'm George Holt. And I'm the Director of Performing Arts uh, here at the North Carolina Museum of Art, and we are so pleased to welcome you to this all-day tribute to our great uh, friend and mentor, Doc Watson. There's nobody on the stage uh, today whose life has not been affected in uh, really a profound way by their association uh, with Doc. And uh, uh, yeah, speaking for myself, I first... Uh, encountered Doc, heard Doc on the National Mall in uh, Washington, D.C. In, in the early 1970s at the uh, Smithsonian Folklife Festival, and that's significant to this uh, uh, ensuing session because it was the founder of that festival, uh, Ralph Rensler, who discovered Doc, and that is a very important story that we're going to uh, get right into. Um, I played a little bit of guitar, but I knew I could never hope to aspire to anything remotely like the skill level of Doc Watson. So I just decided, well, I'm going to try to make this kind of experience uh, available to other people. And I went into the folk festival organizing business, and uh, and uh, I, I guess uh, I didn't feel I had really fulfilled my uh, uh, ambitions until... Uh, uh, in 1978, uh, I, I had the chance to uh, uh, present Doc at the at the Eno River uh, Festival in 1978, and uh, uh, Ralph came down to help with that, and it was a really important moment uh, in my career. So let me uh, introduce our crew to you. We've got some of uh, the same participants as you will note, and some new faces for you. Uh, Joe Wilson, again, on the far right. Uh, Joe. Just, uh, just to remind you, Joe, longtime uh, executive director of the National Council for the Traditional Arts, the uh, founder of the Blue Ridge Music Center on the Blue Ridge Parkway near Galax, and the world's leading authority on Southern Appalachian music and culture. I, Feel like that is no hyperbole, and Joe grew up just uh, 15 miles uh, north of Boone, just over the Tennessee uh, line. Uh, next to Joe, to his left, Barry Poss. I know many of you know Barry. <laughs> Barry, of course, is the founder of Sugar Hill Records, a wonderful label dedicated to the very best in bluegrass and old-time music. And uh, Barry and I <laughs> go way back to uh, to the early 70s, and uh, uh, but Barry uh, Barry Barry has made a heck of a contribution with the creation of that label, that uh, of course um, features uh, many many Doc Watson uh, titles, and Barry and Doc were were, were very close. Uh, David Holt next to Barry. Everybody knows David Holt. I like to tell people that David's my soul brother. We a we actually think we our lineages cross way way back in the somewhere in the 1800s. Uh, but of course, David uh, uh, traveled uh, with Doc for years and years, and, and just got to be the closest of friends. And he made this uh, fantastic three CD uh, compilation of stories and uh, music. Uh, th that that really is sort of an oral history of Doc Watson and Doc's own words. It won the Grammy Award, and we'll touch on that later on today, and that uh, set is available for sale out in the lobby, so if you don't have it, you need to get it. T. Michael Coleman, Doc's longtime bass player. <laughs> Traveled with Doc and Merle for years, and... Uh, 
but more than that, I mean, just the, uh, he is the great uh, bluegrass uh, bass player, worked uh, in the, uh, with Seldom Scene and the, in the great bluegrass band Chess Peak. So we're so glad to have you with us. And to T. Michael's left is Jim Collier, hometown Raleigh boy. That's Don High School. Uh, Jim is uh, a wonderful uh, old-time uh, banjo fiddle player um, uh, whose entry into the music really, I think, was directly through his uh, encounter with the Watson family. Uh, he was so moved by some recordings he heard. He uh, moved up to Boone, went to Appalachian State just to be near the Watson family, uh, became very close uh, to Arnold uh, Watson uh, in particular in his family. So we're really pleased to have Jim. And then our esteemed, distinguished moderator, Mr. Ro uh, Dr. Robert Cantwell. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Bob uh, is a professor of English and American Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. He is a chaired physician there. He uh, is uh, deeply, deeply knowledgeable about folk music and the folk revival and has written whole books on the subject. And uh, he, just like the rest of us, or sort of swept up in, in that wonderful uh, folk music revival in the late 60s and early 70s. And that uh, figures in, uh, to our, uh, uh, our session uh, uh, now in, in a big way. So thank you for being with us. Uh, this session will be followed at 2.30 by uh, a, a, a sort of a performance workshop with many of the musicians who are going to be performing tonight. And we're going to try to get at a little demonstration of uh, the Doc Watson uh, technique and style and magic. So um, we've got, uh, we'll be here till 4 in the afternoon, and I think you will not want to leave your seat. Okay, Bob, it's uh, in your hands. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me all right? I want to thank George for uh, coming up with this idea and arranging it all. And, and uh, yeah. And, and not just this, but, but, but all the work he does for the performing arts in North Carolina and, and has done for years. I mean, he's, he's really kept uh, traditional music alive here in the center, central part of the state. And so we owe him a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude. Uh, I also want to thank Kermit and David for showing up this morning. Wasn't that a great session? Yeah. 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 You know, when, when Doc died, uh, I'm sure you had the same feeling. You, you felt that the uh, entire state of North Carolina went into deep mourning. I think we all took it personally. Um, but what I found the last couple of weeks, I'm sure you have too, is that uh, it gives us a chance to look back on Doc's life, listen to the interviews, go back to the music, maybe have not listened to it for a while. And, uh, you know, you're kind of reminded of what a tremendous blessing it was to have that man and that musician in our lives. So I say uh, hallelujah. You know, it was a great career, and we're so lucky to have, to have had him. Um, now, I, I feel uh, myself uh, honored to be with these folks on the uh, panel. I don't know why they need a moderator. I was thinking about that. I think it must be because Joe is sitting down at the end there. <laughs> he could probably use a little, maybe a little moderation, or maybe not, maybe not. <laughs> but the uh, the gentlemen sitting here have done so much to uh, to to uh, enhance, to add a dimension to to enrich Doc's career, to make him available to us in ways that he might not otherwise have been available, maybe prompted him in certain directions that he wanted and needed to take and gave him the opportunity. I'm thinking about T. Michael. Imagine being the guy whom Doc prefers to play the bass with him. Can you imagine? Uh, that is, as Ralph Windsor would have said, the good housekeeping seal of approval. Right? So, yeah, that's that. And David Holt's uh, legacy album with... Uh, with Doc, I think is a national treasure. It uh, belongs up there, I think, with uh, Alan Lomax's uh, interviews with Joey Bell Morton and, and Woody Guthrie and, and Hubie Ledbetter. It's a great document. So thank you, David, for that. Jim here, I hear on the grapevine, uh, 
is the uh, leading edge of the folk music revival in the state of North Carolina. Now, now, well, I know he'll deny it, but this is what I hear is going to be the case. So that's what he's doing. You didn't here. hear it from me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Well, our subject. Um, Oh, I had a little thing to say about, about Joe. Uh, you know, uh, you can get a Ph.D. in folklore. In fact, uh, if you wait a couple of years, you could even get a Ph.D. in folklore at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. And I recommend it to anybody who may be interested. Um, but all the book learning in the world is not going to give you that certain feeling for the genuine article that a great folklorist needs to have. And we've had a few great folklorists. We, we had, uh, I mentioned John and Alan Lomax. Ralph Prinsler certainly was one of those people who had an ear for the stuff, knew where to find it, knew how to present it, knew how to make it sound the way it's supposed to sound and all the rest. Well, Joe is one of those. He, he belongs to that group. That's how we should think of him. He's a great folklorist, and don't you forget it. Okay? Now, the, uh, our topic here, uh, if you looked at your printed out web page, which I noticed everybody seemed to have, uh, <laughs> is the folk revival. Uh, but, and, and that's a good place to start, but, you know, I think we're looking at the whole career here. We have people who been involved with Doc right up until, you know, a few weeks ago. So I want, if possible, to talk about the whole career. But George did ask me uh, to say a little bit about folk revival, which was, after all, many eons ago. And, uh, you know, we may need to be <laughs> reminded of uh, what all that was about. <laughs> Just, uh, some people call it the, uh, the folk boom, the folk scare, uh, <laughs> which I think is probably the most appropriate phrase. Uh, so here, here it goes. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the folk revival. Um, just thinking about it in a, in a small way, it, it was uh, an explosion of interest, uh, commercial interest, in folk music, uh, so-called folk music, somehow got into the uh, popular music sphere alongside Frankie Avalon and Fabian and Ricky Nelson and folks like that. Um, somehow. And the uh, inaugural event was uh, the tune which the panelists have mentioned, uh, the Kingston Trio's song, Tom Dooley. Now, Tom Dooley originated in Los County. It, it, it's about a murder that actually occurred uh, shortly after the Civil War. Doc's own relatives, his great-grandma, knew uh, some of the participants. But the Kingston Trio got the song from a, uh, a hiking uh, song collection, an outing club little magazine. That, that's where they found the song. It, it had been collected by a folklorist called Frank Warner in Western North Carolina from another Frank, Frank Prophet. But they got sort of a watered-down version of the song. If you listen to Doc's version, you're getting much closer to what sounds like a real murder ballad. You know, it has a, a little quality of something ghastly in it, and you can kind of feel your hair stand on end when you listen to Doc's version. Uh, the Kingston Trio version was, was a little watered down. It, it, it was sung to a doo-wop beat. They, they actually got some vocal training and got, arranged the song like a doo-wop song because they thought that would make it popular. And they introduced the song with a very grave, sort of donnish kind of speech. I think it was uh, Nick Reynolds who came on and said, uh, throughout history, and then he goes on to talk about the eternal triangle. Right? Now, it turns out that the eternal triangle was a eternal quadrangle in this case. There are several people involved in this complicated love affair. Um, but the thing about it was that these young folks who were coming up, I'm thinking people who were, you know, baby boomers, uh, 11, 12, 13 years old, maybe a bit older, maybe thinking about college. These, a lot of these kids were middle class kids in the North. They loved that lecture hall quality. The lecture hall quality was important. It gave the song a little touch of respectability. It wasn't just an old folk song. You know, it was something that came out of a library somewhere, and you could give a lecture about it. So it went right along with, you know, Dostoevsky and existentialism and all the other stuff that kids would be reading in college in a few years. But there was also that sound of the banjo. 
on the banjo. I don't, maybe Barry can confirm this. I don't think the five string banjo had been heard in pop music, pop music now, for what, 75 years at least? Since uh, Fred Van Epps or some of those players? It just hadn't been around. This was a very new sound to folks who had been listening to pop music on the radio. And there was a sense of the past about it, a sense of history. And I think kids were looking for the past. There was a big past out there that uh, had mostly disappeared behind suburbs and station wagons and shopping malls and all the rest. And so here was the sound of the banjo, very intriguing. And if you look right at it, Tom Dooley's a beautiful song. That, that melody is one beautiful melody with some beautiful changes in it. So there's lots of good reasons why you might want to listen to Tom Dooley and become interested in the folk revival. The other thing is, these kids who had listened to Elvis Presley and Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash, that's wrist music too. They knew that Fabian and uh, Frankie Avalon were fake. Th th those, those guys were got up, they were confections, you know, got up by the, uh, by Tin Pan Alley that was trying to grab the initiative away from all the independent labels that had put out all that great rockabilly music. So, yeah, uh, this was, this had meaning, it was solid, it was authentic, that's what folks were after. Okay, are you with me so far? If, if I talk too long, just start fidgeting like my students do and I'll, I'll shut up immediately. <laughs> um, because I'll get embarrassed and I'll just stop. Um, so a, a good question would be, and I'm going to ask Jim this question in a few minutes, um, why does folk music need to be revived at all? Why do we have to talk about a folk music revival at all? Uh, where did it go? You know, had it died? <laughs> did, did it have to be brought back to life? Well, the answer is uh, kind of yes and no. If you grew up in uh, Raleigh, or, uh, or maybe Charlotte, uh, folk music was, you didn't call it folk music, but it was around. You could hear uh, Lester and Earl uh, on the radio and on the television, and you could hear Bill Monroe on the radio. And uh, my guess is that there are a lot of folks playing the old music in string band style and bluegrass style around in this part of the country. So I don't think that the folk revival hit everyone like a ton of bricks down here the way it did up north because the music kind of had a life of its own. And a lot of young players like, like Wayne and, and, and George and Jim got into it, I think, for precisely that reason. Though I think we'll find out that the, the folk revival had a definite role in, in their genesis as musicians, too. So where did the music go up north? Well, this is a long story. I'm not going to tell the whole story. But I'll tell you, basically, it went underground. It had gone underground. Uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was a great lover of folk music. It was part of the recovery program for him. So that's why he had Billy May Ledford and the Coon Creek Girls and, and other great musicians play for him at the White House. This folk music went, guess what it meant? It meant, you know, folks. <laughs> that's what it was about, folks. And where was the recovery going to come from? The folks. <laughs> the folks who did the work. That's where it was going to come from. So that's why Roosevelt was interested in the folks, okay? Um, but after the Second World War, uh, folk music kind of took a retreat. It had been associated with the labor movement. But if you were looking forward in the 1950s, you'd have to go to summer camp, or you'd have to look in scholarly books, maybe, or you'd have to join a, an outing society or a hiking club where you sang folk songs around the campfire. Or you'd have to find some esoteric record collection, you know, some beatnik in Greenwich Village, look under his bed, and there's a couple of stacks of 78s of the Blue Sky Boys and the Monroe Brothers and Furry Lewis and all the great musicians. So the music was there, but you really had to look kind of hard to find it. If you got to college, Swarthmore, or Oberlin, you might belong to a folk song club. That's where we find Ralph Rinsley. Ralph Rinsley. I'm going to tell you just a bit about Ralph when we get into this. Um, Ralph grew up in uh, suburban New Jersey. I think maybe he wasn't exceptionally happy with uh, life in the suburbs. He was uh, fascinated by New York City's uh, ethnic neighborhoods. Later on, after college, when he was working for Pan Am Airlines, he used to stop at the ethnic clubs and coffee houses and uh, weddings, that kind of thing, in all the cities of the, around the world, the capital cities around the world, because he just loved folks. That's what we're 
really talking about. Right? He loved folks and, and their sense of connection. We have lots of words for this, family, community, clan. I'm not sure what the right word is, but I like the word folks. Your folks, my folks, our folks. You know what I'm talking about. That's what Ralph loved. He saw Pete Seeger at college. He was sold on a five-string banjo. He became uh, fascinated by folk music. And he made some friends in the folk music world, which would have included Mike Seeger, John Cohen, Mike Seeger's, uh, Pete's younger uh, half-brother. And they used to take trips up to a little country music park in Maryland called the New River Ranch. Uh, was it Ola Bell Reed? Ola Bell and Bud Reed ran that, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there they heard folks like Bill Monroe and the Stanley Brothers, and they made the connection. They said to themselves, oh, I, I get it. This is the same stuff we heard on that old Folkways anthology. This is the same stuff that my uncle used to bring home, home on those Library of Congress recordings, okay? So I'm going to stop my story here. Having made that connection, right, they wanted to work it out. If that music they thought to themselves is still going on, we have got to find that. We've got to find those musicians and see if they can, we can't bring them up up north, you know, to the, the concert halls, the university folk festivals, the coffee houses, and see if we can't give them an audience. So that's the story we're going to be telling for the next few minutes. I understand we have a good uh, audio clip of Ralph Rinsler recalling those days and uh, a good uh, video clip of Ralph and Doc talking about their experience together. So let's, let's, let's do that, and then we'll, then we'll go on with this. the bridge experience is where I encountered one of the greatest ballad singers from the anthology. Just by chance at a uh, famous convention where the green lab boys were competing. And I was so bored with all the bluegrass, either ours or other people's, that I went from classroom to classroom, which were assigned as rehearsal rooms, and I walked into one classroom and couldn't walk out. And finally, I asked one of the musicians who was uh, quite compelling, uh, who they were, why they were not playing Brother Will stuff, or uh, let's do it now. And uh, they said, oh, this old guy here is, is kind of training us. He's our neighbor. And I said, well, what's his name? And he said, Tom Ashley. I said, I wonder if he's related to Clarence Ashley, who made records in the 20s. So they said, Tom, you know Clarence Ashley? And he was cross eyed and he said, why, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't, I literally was incredulous. I ran out of the room and got my cigarette and I said, he's in there. <laughs> he said, he's in there. <laughs> and we went back, I, I went back and recorded him with somebody who had good recording equipment and six months later. And another friend of the bridge that was, he has an electric guitar player there because he hasn't played the banjo in 20 years and he didn't practice as he promised. An electric guitar player was Doc Watson. Well, uh, Doc wouldn't play an acoustic guitar and I wouldn't record an electric guitar, so I didn't expect to see him again when I left to pick up a banjo player that was supposed to be there. And the next day he came with an acoustic guitar, and we, we discussed the whole idea of the folk song revival, and he understood instantly that there was a chance here to make hay. And he didn't have to play imitation Eddie Arnold and Rockabilly, which he was doing at the time. And uh, then I, I point back to that kind of activist attitude that you got in England, because people like Bert Lloyd and Ewan McCall were constantly finding great singers, like a fisherman named Sam Warner or Margaret Bay in the streets of Dublin. And they would bring them right into the revival and present them with great dignity. And I had that whole model. For, I, mean, I didn't have to figure anything out. It was figured out for me. But Doc, I had no idea who Doc was. And he didn't know who I was. And uh, he was put off by my reaction to an electric guitar, and I was put off by the idea that someone would want me to record an electric guitar. I was threatened by the whole idea and offended. Well, threatened because you can work that sound on the recording. That's right. That's right. That's right. I had a. Yeah, I had a, s a sound in my mind that I wanted to recapture. Anyway, 
the next day when we started off for Saltville, Virginia, where Tom Ashley's daughter lived, and she was to be part of this recording session. I was sitting on the back of a pick pickup truck, which was being driven by Fred Price, I guess, worked at Howard, and Fred and Doc and Clint were sitting in the cab, and I was on the back with instruments and uh, it was an open back pickup. And I was playing a fast string banjo, I guess it might have been my own. All of a sudden, the car of the truck stopped. Doc got out, made his way on his own to the back of the truck and hopped on and said, let me see that banjo, son. And he played the hell out of it. He played Tom Dooley his way. And I thought to myself, now how does it happen that an electric guitar player can do that? And that's a library of Congress sound. An electric guitar has nothing to do with this. And I just, you know, I didn't, couldn't put it together. I was very simple. Well, you had challenged him by telling him he didn't want his electric guitar. Now he had something to prove. But meanwhile, he borrowed an acoustic guitar. I was surprised he was there all together, but I was not going to deal with pop music, rockability, or electric guitars. And Doc played Tom Dooley, and then he proceeded to tell me that he knew a lot of songs like that, and that his family had known, his, the older members of the family had known Tom Dooley and Lois, Laura Foster, and Annie Melton. Oh, And that, that had happened right there. Walked right into history. Yeah, and Tom Dooley had been hanged right there in Mountain City, Tennessee, and at the Grayson Hotel, if it hadn't have been for Grayson, I'd have been in Tennessee. Grayson Hotel, in which I was staying, was owned by the Grayson family. And when I was saying no to an electric guitar, I wasn't doing it on the basis of anything I'd learned in a formal sense. I was doing it based on a sense of style and musical style, oral style, vocal style. Isn't it great to hear that story from the horse's mouth? I mean, you, I bet everybody in this room has heard that story, some version of that story. And like all good stories, it gets changed around. Uh, but that, that's it. That's, that's the story. Uh, let's look at the, uh, there's a video clip here. Uh, I believe. Here we go. Thinking about those years this afternoon when I was doing it, it was like the guy who had 15 children, and he was asked if he wanted to have a 16th, and he said, I wouldn't take a million dollars for the 15th, and you couldn't give me a million dollars to have a sex with <laughs> There you go. I wouldn't go through that again. <laughs> yeah, I ain't telling you that. But I wouldn't take anything for it either. <laughs> I know. Uh, I don't know how to put this. I love you as good as I know I'm about, buddy. I'm going to tell you this right now in public. But let me tell you something. If I knew what I know about this, when you come down, I'd reach over and say, good buddy, I can't do it. I'll see you later. <laughs> no, I'll you come back in time you want to, and we'll just pick the hell out of it. But I ain't going on the road. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, what he should do is what he does. Did you ever yeah. know about that? Yeah. The dude is to love him, to provide for him, comes, I figure, above anything. Well, it did to me anyway, I don't know. That was, that was the main reason I think. You know I love him either. There's never been a question of that. Yeah. It takes a lot out of things. Uh, the road does. It's gotten a lot easier here of late. Well, you start... The money that we do it all commercial time and it ain't near as hard. Yeah. My dad would like to kill Merle. And just sat there like to kill me. The monotony of it, I don't know, it gets to you psychologically after a while. The one thing that I'll never forget, Doc, was driving all across the country and everybody fell asleep and I drove, I don't know, twenty two hours straight. Mm -hmm. And you were the only person that was able to stay awake and you kept me better entertained than anything I could have heard of. <laughs> Well, talk about suffering here below and, and a whole bunch of songs like that out of your past. Well, I'm going to test this one night. I've sat and talked with you with your life. And it was wonderful. It kept me awake, and I could have driven across the world, wasn't it, being talk and sing. They used to have a song, Ralph, when I was a little boy I hadn't heard, I thought, the other day. I thought I mentioned it to you, not called the altar call. It was called Oh Save. Hmm. It 
was down in the valley to pray. That was, mm. uh, he went driving across Texas, and it must have seemed like it was the whole globe. You were crossing it took so long. Yeah, he ain't no telling him any time. I heard my grandmother saying that, a churn in her attachment. Right. So, you talked about her shelling peas on the porch, and you're sitting at her feet and listening to that. They sing that song while she's shelling peas, and we were driving across Texas in 1962, when we were going to Asheville. 62 or 63, that was one of those two. Yeah, oh. 60. Uh, was there a Pat and Glenn and Tom with us? It was the time that we went out there, and you ended up in May, on May 12th, playing with Bill Monroe at the Ash Grove. That was 63, wasn't it? And then, yeah, because yeah, in 63, we went from the Ash Grove back home, and then stopped in Nashville, and then you ended up playing with Bill. The yeah. Osway was with me that time. Exactly. Yeah. And you ended up playing at Newport. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure did. Yeah. My first concert, you know, I did on my own was in 64. It started on the 17th. I left home on the 17th of March. Uh-huh. Now the dates are all a blur. Yeah. And I got back, I think, the 22nd of May. And the first time I got back from California, I met Mo at the door. He was a little fellow. He said, hello, buddy. <laughs> I <laughs> that. <laughs> yes, sir. You remember the first time I heard I was the was when he first heard to get there. He said, I wondered why everybody didn't throw away their great I'm so glad you saw that, <laughs> aren't you? Um, we, we've got some pictures to look at and we'll talk about, but I, I, I first wanted to ask a question of, of Joe first, but I, I think probably everybody on the panel will want to talk about this. You know, for people like us who care about Doc Watson and the music, that was one heck of a moment uh, when Ralph Frenzler and Doc Watson got together. That was one of those, you know, earth-shattering moments. So I want to ask these guys... Uh, how it was important, how, how they think it was important to them personally, but also, you know, in the larger sense. Joe, what do you think about that? Well, um, everyone in the area up there knew Doc was the best guitar player in the area because they'd heard him on the, the street in front of Jerry Wilson's barber shop, my cousin Jerry. And uh, he, um, uh, he would, uh, he played there because the town bull. Uh, would chase him off the street almost anywhere else. Uh, Boone's a great little town, and it has some nice merchants there. But they didn't like having a blind man uh, 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 sell pencils and play the guitar on the street. But if he, he got in front of Jerry's shop, he could go downstairs if the town bull came to bother him. Or Jerry would come out and talk to the town bull. And the town bull would decide to go do something else after Jerry talked to him, <laughs> because otherwise it might, might be a bad fist fight there. And, and it, but at any rate, we all knew he was the best guitar player, and, and uh, uh, because he'd been there playing. And uh, uh, Tom Ashley, uh, when he met Ralph at uh, Union Grove, had uh, suggested that uh, he'd get a, uh, that they'd get a good guitar player. And Clint was there, and Clint played good guitar, but he was not the kind of lead guitar player, nowhere near what Doc was. So uh, uh, I, I guess there was this knowledge, and, and uh, that, that led to that, that meeting. We should say also that, uh, that Tom Dooley had been recorded before uh, any of these things happened. It was recorded in 1929 by Grayson and Whitter, and G.B. Grayson was another one of Doc's favorite uh, singers from those, those old Victor records. I'll, I'll, do, I, I'll mention one other thing. The, the folk revival was a great amazement to all of us who lived up around there. It's just stunning, you know. Like here suddenly are these professors and all these people are coming to hear our music. <laughs> like, Kind of, kind of unusual. I, I recall talking to Clint Howard about it. He was a great singer. And then Clint uh, uh, told me, he said, 
You wouldn't believe it, Joe, but he says, there's a damn tooth dentist up in Boone that's playing the banjo. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I said, mm. and uh, Clarence, his son, chimed in, and he says, well, you know, he says, there's a doctor down here at, the, at uh, Johnson City uh, uh, who plays. He says, and you know, Dad says, uh, Richard's a doctor. Says, that was Richard Blaustein, the folklore professor. To which Clint said, no, he ain't. He says, he, he's, he's a goddamn talking doctor. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he can't cure anything. <laughs> First, we, uh, we, we hear from uh, Doc in his interview with Ralph about the uh, other side of the experience, uh, looking, looking back on it after many years. But when we get to that, what do you think, Barry, if you had to say, why was that important that, you know, Ralph went down there? What would have Maybe something. You know, maybe maybe that wasn't important. Maybe something else could have happened, given Doc's ability. And so on. The first thing I want to say is following Joe Wilson is like following Jerry Lee Lewis in a concert. You, <laughs> just, you just you don't want to do it. Uh, so I, I came. Uh, I, I got to know Ralph a little bit later on. In fact, uh, I got to know him very well after uh, Merle Watson's funeral. Uh, Ralph and I drove together from Deep Gap down to Charlotte where our George Holt was putting on a program uh, with the old Charlotte radio station. And uh, we had, so we had quite a while to uh, chat about those days. And I realized we were coming at it from a couple of uh, similar places, but some different places. Um, uh, Ralph, in case you're wondering why we're sort of glorified, <laughs> I mean, he was Doc's manager for a while and, and really responsible for getting him, uh, brought him to New York for the first time, um, uh, got him widespread knowledge, got his first record contract, etc. And it wasn't uh, Doc alone. That would have been sufficient. He was also Bill Monroe's manager for a while and really brought Bill Monroe out of the uh, gold rooms. Really, uh, Bill's career was in tatters when, when, uh, when, when Ralph got a hold of him. Um, I, I came out from a slightly different way because uh, I was not part of the Folk revival was sort of part of the post folk revival. You know, it was a little bit later, and 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 I was a punk graduate student uh, here at Duke, and I got to uh, went to the old Union Grove Fiddlers Convention, and fascinated by the earlier generation of uh, of people. So in a way, people like Bill Monroe and Doc earlier on were they were the progressives. They they you know we were trying to get to the older people and who had direct links to the Scots Irish. And Ralph really gave me an appreciation of that link. I mean, it was just a, a remarkable link. There was, um, th th there was nothing really lost or discovered. The music goes underground, it comes above ground, and Ralph really brought it also. It was extraordinarily important for me, certainly later on when I went into the business. Uh, uh, Ralph was, in a way, a great model for um, uh, how to make this music commercial. Uh, and it was indeed commercial. Doc was earning a living for his family. He had made that decision. This wasn't playing on your front porch. This was playing for people paying uh, to hear you. And he learned about entertaining. Uh, Ralph taught him a lot. And uh, I think we are all the beneficiaries for that in the sense that we could be, uh, we could be commercial and uh, make valuable music, valuable contributions. And I think that's that's what I strive for, based on that. You both, uh, both Barry and David have, have said something like this: that Doc uh, kind of paved the way for making traditional music. Kind of, you know, you can retail it in the modern world. You can make it a contemporary, uh, a contemporary kind of music, and make it every bit as exciting and as as current as everything else out there. Ben, were you involved at all in the folk revival? Did it have an influence in your life, or was that something uh, that happened? I was living in California at the time playing rock and roll. But, uh, I, of course, I knew what it was and everything, but uh, I, when I fell in love with traditional music in 1969, that was kind of the, maybe the, the ten, folk revival had been going 10 years then. Came back to North Carolina and just decided that was what I wanted to do, is pursue the music. But uh, what you were just saying is... Um, 
You know, I think Doc had this ability to take an old song and make it sound new by taking some of the edges off of it and giving it, you know, virtuoso playing style, and then uh, take a new song and make it sound old. That was really an incredible uh, um, ability that he had. But, see, Ralph got Doc to play up in New York, in California. He, Doc couldn't get hired for any concerts around Boone or Western North Carolina. They didn't care about Doc Watson. He was a guy playing down on the corner at Wilson's uh, Barbershop, you know. They had to hear about him in the New York Times before they finally, <laughs> no, this is the truth, before they finally gave him any credit and he yeah. got any gigs out there. I just want to say one quick thing about, before we get too far away from that recording please, session. Please, please. So they went to Saltville. They took, they went to, to uh, Clarence Ashley's daughters and they put up blankets all around this room and put Doc and the band, uh, Clarence Ashley and the band in that room and they were in another room and they the band started playing Train That Carried My Girl From Town. I mean, and Doc was just tearing it up. And, of course, they had never even heard anybody play guitar like that before. So after the session, they pulled Doc aside and they said, uh, it was Eugene Earl and, and yeah. Ralph. They said, uh, do you know that old Carter family song called The Cannonball? And Doc said, well, uh, I've heard it, of course, but I, I, we didn't ever have that record. And so they said, well, we got a recording of it right here. Just wondered if you could play it. And so he listens to it and he says, oh, listen. Sarah Carter's hitting the wrong chord there on the heart. <laughs> <laughs> so they knew they had found the real thing. <laughs> I was thinking earlier this morning, you know, of, um, there's a wonderful interview, maybe you heard it, uh, Doc does with Nick Spitzer, the sort of folk radio impresario, and uh, at one point Doc says, you know, it's going to be later on in his life, and he kind of regrets that he's doesn't hear as well as he used to. And so Nick says, uh, oh, really? What, what is that, Doc? And, and Doc says, well, I, I just can't hear the flutter of butterfly wings any longer. And, and at another point, he asks him, uh, what's it like to uh, sit out there on stage and hear all those people clapping hands for you? And he says, it's like getting that birthday gift you always wanted. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. So, Michael, uh, did the folk arrival touch you? What do you think about this uh, this event, uh, Ralph Frinsler and Doc Watson? I also, uh, I was, I grew up in North Carolina, and I was playing rock and roll. I did grow up hearing the banjo. My uncle Woodrow played banjo, and I think Doc approached the music the same way. It's He looked at it as no one's interested in that. That's homemade music, you know? And so the synchronicity of having the northern intellectual and you had the real deal meeting, and Doc also represented a little bit of the uh, rural intellectual as well. The meeting of those two forces is what, at first, the first level of the folk scare was sort of lounge folk. Doc and I used to laugh about that. We'd go, okay, boys, sing it in four-part unison. <laughs> <laughs> so we had the first step. The next step was Ralph going out and finding Bill and Doc. These were the real guys. And so you've got the intellectual who's reading Dostoevsky, and you've got the other people reading a comic book that in the real world meets the intellectual. It sort of helped propel that above the kudzu curtain. <laughs> which, which was over the entire state of North Carolina in those days. <laughs> so now, it, like David said, if you, you know, it's a stranger in a strange land. Doc playing at home. Everyone's heard those tunes. I've heard that. Why, why would I pay $5 to go to a concert? But you get the bottom line in New York, you, get, you go to San Francisco, and they're going to pay real money because here is an honest portrayal of Appalachian music. And Doc, like David said, made it accessible. He made those rock and roll elements of a little polish and a little in drive and force he, like, wrap like a blanket around the audience along with his personality, which I think propelled him, not to mention that the, uh, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band helped a lot of people's yeah. careers. Yeah. So, Thank you so much for that. Now, um, Jim, whom I just met, luckily for me, a few days ago, um, is someone who came upon Doc's music uh, 
in a setting where he was already pretty familiar with uh, traditional music, right? And uh, especially as represented on, uh, on recordings. It, one thing very evident uh, in our whole discussion today, including this morning, is that records are a part of this whole story. You can't talk about traditional music without talking about records. It's records, after all, that really enriched and expanded and broadened uh, Doc's musical imagination. And, of course, he heard and, uh, and remembered and registered everything that touched his, uh, his audio imagination and was able to reproduce it. I want to hear from Jim about how the folk revival uh, figured in his life, his musical life. He's become an expert, highly versatile musician. If, the, if, if he gets any credit, if the folk revival gets any credit for this. Well, I, I was not really, I don't, I never thought much about it being a revival or what was happening. I mean, I saw, saw uh, like Hoot Nanny on TV and things like that, which I didn't really you know, I was interested in playing music like, like David and, and T. Michael. I, I was interested in rock and roll, but I was grasping at anything I could get my hands on to play music to get this thing out of me that I, I, I wanted to play so bad. And, you know, I, I would, would come home and, and listen to or watch uh, Lester and Earl on TV just before wrestling came on. And, uh, and so I would watch that. And, and, you know, the banjo just fascinated me. So that was my first magnet. But you know, as far as as far as you know, Ralph Rensler and his impact meeting Doc on me, I mean, it's very simply said that it, it made it available. And I remember the first time that I heard about Doc Watson was a kid came in my dad's store where I was working. And he said he had been to this little club in Raleigh and he'd heard this blind guy play the guitar like he'd never heard anybody play guitar. And and he told me his name and it was Doc Watson. And so. My connection with Doc Watson, I mean, it, it was sort of like, God, this sounds so cool. I was always intrigued by this club because it was off limits to somebody my age. And, and we used to, I remember my parents riding by there and looking at it and saying, look at those people in there. And they would just sort of congregate and hang around. You know, it was hanging out sort of place. It's called the sidetrack. But anyway, um, so from that introduction to Doc Watson and the fact that Ralph Rensler was, you know, you know had played the part in making him available, uh, to people like me, when I fart, when I started buying records, you know, I'd go to the, the bin, which was called folk music, and the bin had Folkways records in it, and it had Buffy St. Marie and everybody else, and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and you name it, that was in there. And I saw this record, it was Doc Watson Family, and I just, I, I picked it up and I took it home, and there was an immediate connection. It went uh, to my soul like a knife. I mean, it just, bang. And it was, I don't know how to put it, the most powerful experience. And it led me to go explore more about Doc Watson. I remember making a cold call at his house when he was up, he was working on his roof. There was a shingle or something had torn off. <laughs> me and a friend of mine drove to his house. And <laughs> he, he, he took time after he'd, he said, go talk to Nancy for a while. I'll be down <laughs> a little bit. And he came down and spent time with me and my friend. But... Uh, and then, you know, but that was, I guess, I, I, I don't ever think of it in terms of folk world revival as much as there was music that just moved me, and I felt immediately a part of it. And that's all I can say. I think that speaks for most of us, right? Let's look at some of these pictures. I think you get us in the right spot. This is one of the first posters the Friends of Old Time Music uh, put out to advertise uh, Doc Watson's appearance uh, up north. Uh, you can see immediately that there's an effort made here to frame Doc in a certain way, to package him in a certain way. I'm going to run through these uh, because we want to get David to the, that circle album you mentioned. I, I, I think one of the important things to note here, did I do that right? Oops. There's Ralph and Doc playing together. Ralph is a very accomplished mandolin player. Uh, can I tell you? Yeah, please. Ralph, Ralph told him not to play the modern songs, the Eddie Arnold stuff, because Doc had a huge repertoire yeah. through his whole life. He said, don't play that stuff. Uh, just keep with the folk stuff till you're well-known, and then you can start putting in some of that music. Absolutely. Yeah. No, the, the, the idea was to make him appropriate for these concert halls where, where kids wanted, uh, you know, the authentic item. And boy, did they ever get the authentic item. Yeah. Uh, as Jim's suggesting, there's a good picture of Ralph later on. Well, you, everybody knows who that is, right? That's Ralph. And who's in the middle? John Baez. Can I tell you a story about that? Please do. So she came to visit uh, Doc and Rosalie, and 
you know, she was already quite famous, and Doc was just getting going, and she went through bone with him as they walked around Boone barefooted. She thought she was being, like, so country. And then he was like, <laughs> they were horrified that she was having <laughs> barefoot. And there's uh, Doc at uh, Pete Seeger, Pete and Toshi Seeger's uh, dinner table. So that, that's the uh, another uh, sign of a good housekeeping seal of approval, at least from the viewpoint of a northern folk revival. There's Clarence and Doc. Great showman. Clarence is a great showman from the old, the old medicine show days. There's uh, Clarence and Clint and Fred Price and Doc. Looks like they're doing a quartet there, probably a gospel quartet, right? Yeah. <laughs> also, with actually four parts, right? <laughs> there they are on stage. I don't know if I'm allowed to tell anecdotes, but I had to tell you, folks. I, 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 I saw Doc in 1962, his first tour, and, uh, you know, Clint, they're all wearing their white shirts, and here we are in a big concert hall at a big university up in the north, and... Uh, you know, Clint has Doc by the sleeve and is leading him out. Doc always had that little stoop, and these guys started playing, and that guitar started. It was just, I agree with Jim, there was, there was just nothing like it. When you, when you saw that, you were sold. <laughs> Your life was permanently altered. A couple of pictures. Okay, that's the, uh, this is a good place to stop on, on this part of our conversation. Um, Notice how dramatic that picture is. And if you, folks who are interested in history, I'll tell you where that comes from. That style of photographs comes from the Works Progress Administration. Like some of the great photographers of that period who took pictures for Franklin Roosevelt of rural people, that's where that style comes from. And that's the idea that uh, the producers of this album are trying to convey. And I think we should talk about... Can I tell you something about that? Please. Because a pretty funny story about that. Doc, Doc hated this picture. Really? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. The first time he saw it, right? <laughs> People told him about it. They said, why'd you wear that old wrinkled shirt? I mean, he hated this picture. And just a couple of years ago, when I, when I told him that it looked great. You know, he really looked like a working man. And it was a great picture. And he, nobody ever told him that. But uh, anyway. yeah, he finally decided it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knows how to play a C chord the way Doc Watson plays it because of that album. There's Doc and Merle, a nice shot. Uh, now here's here's uh, George Burns to talk about this album. I mentioned earlier that Ralph Rinsler uh, liked the sound of folks, and in those early folk lace albums, on the cover he gave us the picture of the whole Watson family. There's a sense of the whole gang getting together. Clarence, uh, when he introduces uh, Sally Ann, he says, well, we're going to get the whole gang out here fiddling Fred Price with Sally Ann. And there you hear the whole group, and I think that's part of the charm. Something happened quite similar to that with this Circle album. D Davis, David, tell us about the, this album. Why do you think it's important? Oh, well, it's important because it introduced a whole youthful generation to all these guys, not just Doc, but Doc came through as the, the big star of it. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. The funny thing of, to me about Doc in this album is, you know, if you talk to Doc, he would never tell you what the problem was. You had to figure it out. And if you couldn't figure it out, you might as well just kiss it off because he's going to, you know, not going to deal with you anymore. So you had to read between the lines with Doc all the time, don't you think, guys, family over here? Yeah. And uh, so John McEwen, they were at a party in California and asked Doc if he would play on this record. And uh, what Doc remembered is that John didn't ask Merle to play on it. And uh, so Doc was mad about that. Continued to be mad at John McKean for the rest of his life, I might add. And uh, so he, he went up and said, you asked Merle about it? And John said, no, we, we, we really just wanted you to play it. And uh, so then Doc talked to Merle about it. He said, I'm willing not to do this record uh, uh, unless you think we should. And Merle said, oh, Daddy, it's going to open up a whole generation to us. No, you should you should play on it. It'll be good for us. Because times were getting hard in 72. The, they weren't making as much as they had hoped. And uh, so they did. And of course, it just was, it blossomed and was it one of the most important yeah. records in American history, really. Absolutely. And what you heard the reason, this is the reason they hired me. Did you play that record? Yeah. Oh, you weren't on before this? No, I wasn't before this. They did this. And Doc Real, I mean, Merle realized that 
they were opening up to a wider audience because of this record, and they wanted to add a bass player. And so I, I had known Merle because I was in a band up in the mountains of North Carolina. We sort of played Doc Watson music with congas and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we used to open up for Doc and Merle. And uh, after that band disbanded, uh, Merle asked me if I would like to go play with he and his dad, and I go, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, short story, I went to his house to rehearse. We played one song. Doc said, here do, and that was it. <laughs> that was the last time you rehearsed at that. That was the last time we rehearsed in 15 years, and the reason I sat in the middle is because we never rehearsed, and thank goodness I played guitar. That's how I knew the chords. <laughs> Usually you have the star in the middle, but I sat in the middle because I had to see. He, the really hard part is the capo positions. Oh, my goodness. They're tra <laughs> yeah. transcribing immediately. But anyway, it's, it's, thank you. And this is another thing of the synchronicity of the new guys. And you got bringing forward these guys. Mm -hmm. It makes them more accessible to the hippies right. who are wanting a more earthy thing because they were tired of you know being slammed over the head by music. And they discovered... A lot of these guys, and a lot of these guys benefited because of this record. Right. Uh, maybe you remember the conversation between uh, Doc and, um, and Merle on this album, not Merle Watson, but uh, the great Merle uh, Travis. And uh, this is the first time they met on the, on the, on the album, in the recording session. And uh, Doc says, Merle, I, I just love your picking on that coal mining album. And... Uh, and Merle says, well, yeah, I put that together in six or eight weeks. Uh, it was a rush job. And, and then he says, well, look who's talking. <laughs> look who's talking. This is the dark house. So, I, the point is that, that uh, you, hear, you heard folks. You heard the folks in the recording studio getting together to make their music. And I think that is what touched. Now, you know, I can't believe my watch is 2 o'clock. I, I, I wish we had another couple of hours up here, I swear. Um, but we, we should have some questions. And we've got folks on this panel who, who know Doc's career, as I say, up to the present moment. I'd love to hear you uh, ask questions about that. Doc had a, a huge career, well beyond the, what we've talked about. So maybe you've got some questions on this for Yeah, back here. The question was, where did Watson Otto get all the cool shirts? Oh, yeah. Watson Otto, wasn't it? Well, no, back, yeah. in the, back in the 70s, he had, Merle had a maid. There was someone in Colorado that made those shirts. Right. And yeah. they made me one, too, which I don't fit into anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but later on, he got all those shirts at that auto right. store. Wh what's it called? Watson Otto? Watson Otto. Uh, They're in uh, <laughs> the... Don't all go there at once. <laughs> <laughs> sir, sir, some more. Sir. Good question. question was, what role did Merle Fest play in Doc's career? He was absolutely up there still, but once again, there's the, the, the music sort of crests and falls and crests and falls. Uh, uh, we were involved with the first Merle Fest, um, and, you know, anybody, sorry, if anybody is here or there, it was just on a flatbed truck in the, in the back, a few people, and then by the time Dolly Parton showed up. It was what 80, 80 to 100,000 people uh, over a weekend. It ranked right up there when, when people would talk about major music festivals. Uh, it would be Telluride and and, uh, and Merlefest. But the thing about Merlefest was that it it started by an accident. There was a botanist at Wilkes Community College who wanted to have a little garden and. Doc was a vehicle, and he knew nothing about the music, really knew nothing about Doc Watson at all, and and uh, uh, he booked the first festival himself. Well, of course, all the musicians, as people call them, will attest, came for free because it was for Doc. I mean, and, and for, for, for quite a long time, uh, that festival ended up being the major uh, development vehicle for the entire college, probably for Wilkes County. Uh, and for, you know, tens and thousands of people uh, just traveling to hear Doc. I mean, and, and Doc would, no matter, even in, towards the end, uh, Doc would always rally 
uh, to just to play fabulously on, on that stage. And the, the, the great thing about that festival, I would say, and Doc was, especially in the early years, um, there was a habit of just playing with whomever was, was around. So you really got some oddball combinations. And Doc was, was the glue, of course. Uh, he, he just made everybody feel comfortable, sound great, and it, and it all came out sounding like it uh, belonged. Uh, I understand that uh, Doc depended profoundly on, on Merle in, in his travels, and, and so the loss, of course, was, was catastrophic. But he was aroused uh, from his uh, grief by a, a dream of Merle coming to him and saying, uh, you can make it, Dad. So that's when he came back and, and had the idea of doing Merle Fest. I think it was Rose Lee's idea. I think it was Rose Lee's idea to have a, a music festival to, uh, in honor of Merle. Let's, let's hear some more questions. We have a few minutes. Uh, in the back, yes, 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 yes. yes sir. please. Question is, where does the new Port Folk Festival figure? You mean that's what the one you mean, right? That, where does that figure into this whole story? Let's try that one. Yeah, Joe. Sure. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Ralph <coughs> Ralph Renzel, my long gone friend, uh, 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 was the uh, uh, booked uh, a lot of traditional people into uh, he uh, uh, he bu booked Genus, Genus Cockrell, uh, all kinds of people, old time traditional people into Newport. That did not fit well with some of the leadership that. Uh, the Ween group at, uh, at Newport. So uh, uh, it, it allowed uh, uh, Ralph to find out that he could do this and make it work. And it gave him a little reputation. And it got him a job uh, working for Jim Morris at the Smithsonian. And pretty soon, uh, since uh, Ralph knew a lot more than Jim Morris, he was running that office. And that's... Uh, that's uh, the effect that it uh, that it had. And I think mainly in developing uh, Ralph's skill at doing a thing that changed that a little bit. Ralph uh, introduced the idea of uh, of uh, craft uh, work at the Newport Folk Festival, and he incorporated that with the festival at the Smithsonian. And nowadays, you when you look at folk life at the Smithsonian, hear folk music again. It's in the context of a whole way of life. It's about a whole way of life and people who do for themselves, as we heard this morning, people who tell stories uh, instead of watching television. So, yeah, that's that's a, lot, a large part of what it was about. Let's hear some more questions. Add, add yes. one thing. Add yeah. one thing to that. It was Ralph Rensler's interest in Jugtown down here that helped do the, the pottery revival in North Carolina. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sir. That's a great question. Yeah, I think it's the, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the other way. Uh, well, yes, Merle Fest was reflecting Doctor for as long as I've known him, you know, thirty some odd years. Uh, uh, Doc listened to everything, and the time he recorded with us over you know a dozen albums or so, I was always, I'm sure David did the same. You did the same. We'd be sending him cassettes all the time. You know, he'd want to hear this, he'd want to hear that, and you can look at Doc's career almost like a continuum, you know, with, with traditional music at one end and progressive music at the other end. And you can follow his career back, you know, back and forth. He started traditional, uh, very quickly playing electric guitar, rockabilly, hot swing. And then and Ralph got a hold of him and understood the value of going back. And then he was sort of inching back by the time he signed with the major labels, uh, in, uh, United Artists, I think, in the 70s. Under Cowboy Jack Clement's influence, he was, it was 
was pretty rocking, you know. It was, uh, um, and then for us, I think it was moved moved back uh, towards towards the middle. But the, the the great thing about Doc is he was so he was a stylist in the same way that Frank Sinatra was a stylist. You know, you, it didn't really matter what. You, I, I listened to um, uh, writing the Midnight Train album the other day. Just as part of this, and it's supposed to be a bluegrass album. It is a bluegrass album, but it doesn't sound, it sounds like a Doc album, you know, and same thing with his gospel record, and the same thing with Dockabilly. It's even, you know, it's it's all, do- he, he just like Frank said, he owns the music. I mean, that's that's really what it was, was about, and it's just this wide eclecticism. And to what you said, uh, his broad repertoire, Allowed us to play festivals like Telluride, Red Rocks. We pl- we were playing. We'd play, and there would be Commander Cody and Doc Watson. Instead of playing on a flatbed truck at a small folk festival, because his music had a broader range, allowed us to play bigger venues and venues that would expose him to a wider audience. That's a, I love those answers. I'll just add a tiny footnote. Every lick Doc plays uh, takes you someplace. E- even back in the early days, he'll play a lick somewhere in the middle of a song there. It'll take you back to the Ryland Auditorium in 1956 or San Antonio in the 1930s. Everything he played had a musical content. He was all over the place all the time. So when you're listening to Doc Watson, you're in his whole musical world all the time. And his, uh, he's always reaching out that way. The way a great jazz player would do the way a great, great jazz player would do. Adding one thing to what Michael said, uh, uh, I knew two great guitar players pretty well who uh, had worked with them who uh, Doc had influenced Doc. One of them was Merle Travis and the other one was Kyle Farlow. And uh, what they had in common was that they both loved Doc Watson with all their heart. Yeah. Interesting story. We were... Uh, we were at LaGuardia Airport. We got on the Hertz bus to go get a car, and sitting in there was Pat Metheny, the huh. jazz guitar player. <laughs> he started going, he goes, oh, my God, that's Doc Watson. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't tell you how in El Bimiola, we were playing uh, the Bread Roses Festival in uh, California. Michael, can you introduce me to Doc? Can you introduce oh. me to Doc? And I go on to Doc and said, Al Daniello wants to meet you. And he goes, hey, just tell him I'm eating my cheeseburger. I'll see him in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, if you're up to me, I'd sit here uh, all the rest of the afternoon with these guys. Uh, but we, we have another session coming up. One more question. One more question. Uh, sir. Yeah. I think Joe is the person to answer that question. Oh, oh. Yeah. Being away, he, this he is about Doc it. being away from home and on he, the road. He, is there a musician alive that doesn't hate to road? <laughs> yeah, imagine being blind and he's, sitting, he's there all day long. Nothing fun about it. Nothing fun about him. I, I tell you a funny story. We, we were playing in, Las, playing in California. And uh, we were driving along the coast, and, and I said, man, I'd love to stop at this beach. I used to go here when I was a kid. I said, you want to get out and walk on the beach? He said, no, I hate the ocean. <laughs> I said, I said, really, I mean, just to, we don't have to go very far. You can just, like, listen to the waves and the seagulls. And he said, no, I don't even like the sound of it. I said, what happened? He said, when he first came out to California, somebody put him up in Malibu Colony there. And if you've ever been there, the, the waves actually come under the houses, and there's rocks under the houses. So it's just this roaring sound, as, you know, when the tide comes in. And he was sleeping in one of those bedrooms above those rocks, you know, being scraped across by the ocean. And it just drove him crazy. He thought the whole house was going to come down in the water, so he didn't like the ocean. So it's things like that that, you know, little crazy things that you just get tired of eating out and, you know, staying in motels and having motels for him be different. You know, he wanted the bathroom on the right and walk in, the bed right there, another bed over here, that's it, you know. We get in some of these fancy places and they'd be all fancy schmancy and he couldn't find his way around as easy. Yeah. Folks, thank you for coming and I uh, hope to see you this afternoon and this evening. Thank these panelists for their favorite.